to this diagram. And I want to discuss why, when you look at this crime scene, why this is not a natural death. As you've, as you've seen the pictures, Laura's laying on her back. And the first thing is she's naked from the waist down. You've seen and her legs are spread. The first thing about that is, that is completely inconsistent with how she, she would typically sleep. You've heard from her boyfriend that she would sleep with her, either boxer shorts on, some type of underwear like that, or long uh, pajamas. But she would never just put on a shirt and sleep in the nude, in the sense of being uh, without clothing from the waist down. So that's the first sign that something is not right with this situation. Now, if you recall, her head is by the footboard and her feet are by the headboard. Now, if she's sleeping normally with her head by the headboard and she has a heart attack, let's assume that perhaps she may have fallen out of bed. Is she going to somehow flip around and end up in the position that she was found? That's not going to happen if she dies of a heart attack. Think about, in addition, the pillow that was here covering her head. And then, in combination with that, the blanket that was in this area, but was underneath her, even under her left arm. You look closely at that exhibit in deliberations. What you're going to see is that a blanket is completely under her. How on earth, if someone dies in their bed of a heart attack, are they going to have the blanket be put in that position? It doesn't make any sense. And how is that pillow going to end up being on top of her head from the side that it was? If you recall, she's laying on her back, and the pillow was on her left side like this. There's simply no way on earth that that would happen if this were simply a natural death. And she had a heart attack and fell out of bed. But then, if you recall the testimony here about the bed itself, and you've seen the photograph of the pattern on the bed, both Dr. Kasson as well as um, Detective Sergeant Bunchu <coughs> testified that that was a drag pattern on the bed, as if someone had been dragged off that bed and pulled to the floor, which makes perfect sense when you think about the blanket underneath her. Someone grabbed that after she was incapacitated, after she was no longer with us. Someone grabbed that blanket and pulled her off the floor. And that's why you see, or pulled her off the bed onto the floor, which is exactly why you see the blanket underneath her and then the pillow on top of her head. Now, and I want you to look at these things in combination as well and how they, the cumulative nature of these things as each of these individual facts build on each other. Think about, of course, the tampon here. Is Laura Dickinson, as she's dying of this so-called natural death, going to pull out her tampon and just toss it across the floor? It, it, is that what you do if you're in the last throes in the middle of the night? Of course not. If you use your common sense and life experience, you should know Laura Dickinson did not remove that tampon. Orange Taylor removed that tampon. I expect you'll hear this argument. Well, there, his DNA wasn't on the tampon. Well, first of all, when you think about the tampon, Think about the fact that, of course, Laura's DNA was on it. But if you remember the chart and the 13 genetic locations, there were only seven of those locations that there was genetic material from Laura herself. And she would have clearly been touching that tampon, in particular the tampon string. But here's the other fact about that. And there was a small point in the defendant's statement that you heard. There was a point where the defendant told Detective Farkas, Detective Farkas said, we got your fingerprints in there. And Orange Taylor was, no, I don't, I don't think you do. And 
what he said was specifically, I mean, you shouldn't even find fingerprints, really, though. Because when I was in there, I was like this. You know what, you know what I'm saying, doing like this. And what he was doing, what he was showing to the detectives is, he was like this. Which means, this is someone who thinks about leaving evidence at locations. And if he is, when he's in a room stealing things, going to take measures to not leave evidence behind, like pull his hands in to his sweatshirt, then think about that when he pulled out that tampon. Did he do it that way? Did he just simply use his shirt to pull it out so he wouldn't leave anything there? Now, in addition to all of that, all these facts I've just been describing, you know that Laura's keys and her lanyard are missing. If you look closely at the video, at 12, at about, excuse me, 11 o'clock on December 12th, when she comes in, you see her at the door. That's a locked door at that time. No one lets her in the way Orange Taylor gets in. So she has to use her key, and you actually can see very, it's very difficult to see, but you can see her lanyard hanging down her hand as she goes to walk up the stairs. So we know she had her keys that night. Of course, she walks up the stairs with them. She goes in her room, probably sets her keys down. Why is this bathroom door locked as well as this main door locked and her keys are missing? Is that consistent with the natural cause death? How can you, any of you square that fact with someone who died of a heart attack? If she died of a heart attack, where are the keys? Unless someone took them, went outside into the hallway, and locked the door. Now, the other part of all this natural death theory is the fibers that I'll talk about in a little bit. But if this were a natural death, and you take the evidence in terms of what Orange Taylor said to the police in this case, he never saw a girl there, he never went that far into the room, then why are foreign black acrylic fibers on her shirt, on her skin, on the pillow, both sides? And why are blue nylon fibers on the shirt that the police find in the defendant's home that match the blue blanket found laying and underneath Laura Dickinson? That consistent with some type of natural death? And so, when you start putting all these facts together, it should become clear that Dr. Casson's opinion and all everything together that you know, even things that Dr. Casson doesn't, you should be led to the conclusion that this was a homicide and that the cause of death was asphyxiation, blockage of the airway. And I hope in your deliberations, when you do think about whether this was a person who had a heart attack in bed, what that would look like, what you would expect to see in that situation, and how different it is from what you're seeing in this case.